Hey everybody, it's Miss Espen Chip. Today we're going to do this PowerPoint um, for nutrition. Uh, it's Unit 4, Module 1, and the title is Food Safety Habits and Cultural Patterns. Um, I did post a uh, PowerPoint previously. It was a really good one on cultural food habits. I hope that you all have looked at that. Um, and so anyway, we'll begin. All right, so food and pesticides. So pesticides we know are widely used in producing food to control pests, such as insects, rodents, weeds, bacteria, mold, and fungus. And under the Food Quality Protection Act, um, the EPA must ensure that all pesticides used in food in the United States meet um, the FQPA stringent safety uh, standards. So food add additives and contaminants, um, as we know many uh, foods are um, stored and substances are added to prolonged uh, shelf and storage life and to enhance the color and the flavor and the texture uh, some of those additives play a role uh, in increasing cancer risk, and it's really of uh, huge public interest. So, as I said, new food additives have to be cleared by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, before being allowed into the food supply and through testing um, done in a lab with animals to determine any effects on cancer as part of this process. Additives are usually present in very small quantities in food, and some are nutrients that have some beneficial effects. Uh, for example, vitamin C and E are sometimes added to food products as a preservative. Other com um, compounds find their way into the food supply through agriculture use, animal farming, or food processing, even if their use is not directly intended for human consumption. And some examples of that include uh, growth hormones or antibiotics used in animal farming, small amounts of pesticides and herbicides in plant-based foods, and compounds um, such as uh, bi bisphenol A or BPA um, might enter um, the food uh, from the packaging that they use. Um, some of them are not known to directly cause cancer, but they may influence cancer risk in other ways, um, for example, by acting as hormone-like substances in the body. Unintended contamination of food may also result in exposure to chemicals that are cause of concern and might be related to cancer. Examples include heavy metals, such as uh, cadmium or mercury. And these metals may enter the food supply if they build up the food chain, um, like from fish, or they may enter through contamination um, or their natural presence that's in the soil or the water. So let's talk a little bit about food processing. Um, it may also alter foods in ways that might affect cancer risk. An example is the refining of grains, which greatly lowers the amount of fiber and other compounds that may reduce cancer risk. The processing of meat by adding preservatives, such as salt or sodium nitrate, to prevent the growth of germs. Or smoking the meat to preserve or enhance color and flavor. Um, you might add compounds that might increase the potential of these foods to cause cancer by doing these things. Um, so, so basically studies have linked eating large amount of processed meats with an increased risk of colorectal cancer. And it might be due to nitrates, uh, which are added to many, many lunch meats, hams, hot dogs, and other processed meats. So nitrates are, are really bad for us uh, for lots of reasons um, other than cancer, but that's why we always tell everybody, especially those low sodium people, to um, avoid all those processed meats. 
Um, sun food processing, like freezing and canning uh, veggies and fruits, can preserve vitamins and other components that may decrease cancer risk. Cooking or heat treating, like you know when you can something, uh, vegetables um, break down the plant cell walls and may allow the helpful compounds in these food to be more easily digested. But some of these methods may also lower the content of some heat sensitive vitamins um, like vitamin C and some B vitamins. Um, eradicated foods um, is one way to limit the risk of germ contamination and food poison. So it's um, irradiation. In the United States, some foods such as spices are routinely irradiated. Irradiated meats and other foods are also widely available. Because radiation is known to cause cancer, there has been some concern that food um, irradiation may present a cancer risk. However, radiation does not mean remain in the foods um, that have been irradiated. Okay. Of course, organic foods, we talk about organic, eat organic. Um, it comes about from concerns about the possible effects of food additives on health, including cancer. It's one of the reasons that many people are now interested in organic foods. Organic foods are often promoted as an alternative food uh, grown with conventional methods that use chemical pesticides and herbicides, hormones, or antibiotics. So these are foods that are alternative with the conventional methods that use all of those pesticides, hormones, antibiotics, and herbicides. These compounds cannot be used um, for food labeled as organic. Organic foods, as defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, also exclude genetically modified foods or foods that have been irradiated. Okay, so GMOs. Whether organic foods carry a lower risk of cancer because they're less likely to be contaminated by compounds that might cause cancer really is not known. Um, several studies looked at the nutrient content of organic versus conventionally grown fruits and vegetables. And some studies uh, suggest a higher nutrient content. Others suggest no different. It's just not known if the nutritional differences that have been reported would result in health benefits like a reduction in cancer risk. Vegetables, fruits, and whole grains should be um, from the central part form the central part of a person's diet, regardless of whether they are grown conventionally or organically. Um, I took uh, some YouTube videos, put them on your module for you guys to watch. One of them was the top 10 food additives. Um, another was unhealthy ingredients and in food additives. And then one from Dr. Oz, um, the foods and Oprah, the, the, um, five ingredients you should stop eating right now, and then one on GMOs, and then one on do we really need pesticides. So I hope that you guys have had a chance to watch that. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, ways that various organisms uh, may contaminate your food. Before I get into all of that, I do want to let you know one of your questions on your modules was about um, government agencies that are responsible for the maintenance of a um, of food supply, safe food supply. So that would be the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA is responsible under the Food Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act for enforcing tolerances established by the EPA for amounts of uh, pesticide residues that may legally remain on food, including uh, animal feed. The FDA manages that task through multiple programs and strategies um, in its regulatory pesticide residue monitoring program. Uh, the FDA selectively tests a broad range of imported and domestic commodities 
for approximately 700 pesticide residues. The FDA also conducts uh, focused sampling surveys for specific commodities or selected pesticide chemical residues that are of special interest. Um, additionally, in the Total Diet Study, TDS, the FDA monitors the levels of pesticide chemical residues in foods that have been prepared for consumption and represent the average U.S. diet. So there you have that. Now let's get into how organisms may contaminate your food. <clears throat> so it's actually pretty easy for food to be contaminated. Uh, so it's not really that surprising that about 5 million of us get ill each year as a result of eating or drinking contaminated food. Uh, maybe even more worrying, perhaps, for those of us who are involved in producing, processing, preparing, supplying, or serving food, is the sharp increase in compensation claims being submitted through personal injury lawyers from those made ill from food poisoning. So the lawyers are trying to make big on this. So how does it become contaminated? Um, it's when something unpleasant or harmful ends up in food, obviously, and this can happen in one of three ways. Um, physical contamination, uh, chemical contamination, uh, biological contamination um, are the three ways that it happens. So physical contamination it's when things like hair, glass, plasters, dirt, insects, or other foreign bodies are present in the food. Physical contamination is usually visible and can happen at any stage of the production or preparation process. So where do physical contaminants come from? They come from buildings or equipment, like bits of plaster or brick, flakes of paint, broken glass or tile, screws and nails and pieces of wire or cable. Potentially any of these could be dangerous and might result in broken or chipped teeth, cuts to the lips, mouth or throat, choking or worse if swallowed. It can come from food packaging and that includes bits of wood, glass, cardboard, or uh, polythene, as well as elastic bands, staples, string, or ring poles. It can come from pests and insects, like rats, mice, flies, maggots, God help us, rodent hairs, tails, or droppings, wasp, slugs, and caterpillars. Not only are they contaminants in their own right, but harmful bacteria from their bodies can also be spread through this means. And it can come from food handlers, including fingernails, plasters, pieces of jewelry or clothes, chewing gum, wrappers, pin tops, and of course hair. When because we lose about 75 hairs a day, even more if our hair is greasy. Isn't that wonderful? So those are the ways physical contamination takes place. The next way is a chemical contamination, and that's when food contains pesticides or cleaning or other chemicals, um, products like bleach are too strong to be used in food prep areas and have the potential to contaminate. Chemical contamination can also happen when certain foods come into contact with harmful metals through metallic containers or when soil or water is contaminated by pollution. Sometimes this may only taunt food, but other chemicals such as bleach are very harmful and can cause severe vomiting, organ damage, or even death. So how do pesticides contaminate the food? Um, through pesticides and fungicides that are used on a farm through additives uh, to animal feeds that uh, may be present in animal and poultry meat, through plants and animals exposed to contaminated water or soil, 
that later becomes food and how do cleaning chemicals contaminate food? Food can be contaminated if cleaning chemicals aren't properly used or if the wrong chemicals are used. Not all cleaning chemicals are safe to use in food areas. For example, bleach is too strong. Contamination happens when food comes into contact with equipment, work services, surfaces, sorry, or food containers that have been treated with these unsuitable chemicals. How about metal? How does that contaminate food? Uh, chemicals from metals uh, can contaminate food. Some uh, metals, such as uh, cadmium, sometimes used in kitchen equipment like uh, fridges and cookers, and zinc, which is used for galvanizing, are harmful and must not come into contact with food. Tin cans can be a hazard as they are made of iron coated with tin plate. If unlined, acidic foods like fruit or tomatoes can react with the tin and be absorbed by the food. The food is harmful and shouldn't be eaten. Once canned foods are open, the contents need to be transferred to another container Food left in open tin cans starts to react and will end up being tainted and tasting metallic. So those are the, phys the physical and the chemical contamination um, ways that food can be uh, tainted. So the other um, way is by biological contamination. And that's when the food becomes in, uh, contaminated, obviously, by a virus or a bacteria, parasites, or mold. In food safety terms, there are two types of harmful bacteria, pathogenic, which causes food poison, and spoilage, that, uh, of course, causes food to rot, decompose, and perish. Basically, germs can infect food on the farm, in the kitchen and just about anywhere in between if adequate safety precautions are not taken. So let's look at how raw food becomes contaminated. So let's talk about raw meat and dairy first. Many germs that cause illnesses in humans live in the intestines of healthy animals raised for food, including E. coli. Typically, this bacterium remains in the discarded portions of the animal though occasionally meat can become contaminated with this bacterium if it comes into contact with just a tiny amount of the animal's intestinal contents. Okay, equally worrying, um, after about a year-long survey of supermarket chickens, a report published um, at the beginning of 2015 revealed that almost 73% of them are infected by Campylobacter, the largest cause of food poisoning. Not surprisingly, eggs, raw milk, and cheese are often contaminated too. So fresh produce and fish um, eating fruits and vegetables are essential part of healthy diet but they too can be contaminated before they even hit the shelves. There have been many cases uh, when produce uh, from spinach uh, to raspberries become, came in uh, contaminated with bacteria, viruses, or parasites that are usually found in the intestines of animals. So how does this happen? So there's many ways that produce can be infected. Uh, it's important to remember that fruits and vegetables are grown in the soil around farm animals, wild animals, birds and fowl. So animal waste may be deposited in water that then irrigates the crop or in the field itself. Uh, water can be used to wash the produce um, that it might, and that might not be safe to consume or improper sanitation procedures used in the field may also lead to contamination. Sadly, organic fruit and vegetables are just as likely to be contaminated with germs as standard produce. 
fish too can become contaminated by bacteria from the ocean water they live in. Finally, let's talk about parasites. Parasites are organisms that live in another organism, the host, and often harm it. Numerous parasites, including roundworms, flukes, and tapeworms can be transmitted through food. And this is how. So undercooked fish, crabs, and mollusks, wild salmon and sea trout, so undercooked uh, meat as well, raw aquatic plants like uh, watercress, raw vegetables contaminated by human or animal waste. Contamination can and does occur at any stage of the food journey, whether that be during preparation, storage, cooking, hot holding, or reheating. Though some stages are more perilous than others, Similarly, there are a number of foods that are more susceptible to becoming contaminated, and these are referred to as high-risk foods. The problem with pathogenic bacteria is that you cannot see, taste, feel, or smell it, which makes it really difficult to detect, and even worse, it grows at alarming rates, and therein lies the biggest problem. In order to grow bacteria, four things are required. Food, moisture, time, and warmth. Although room temperature is ideal, these bacteria can grow rapidly, multiplying about every 10 to 20 minutes um, at anywhere between five degrees Celsius and 63 degrees Celsius. This temperature range is called the danger zone and you may be able to remember it by thinking it's between the age of starting school five and pension age about 63-ish. Putting that into context, just one single cell of bacteria at breakfast time left in the danger zone, that um, temperature range, the danger zone, has grown from breakfast time to tea time by about a million. This means that food left for any length of time in the danger zone can quickly become dangerous to eat. If you're not careful, bacteria can multiply on food whenever you A, defrost it, you prepare it or handle it, you cook it, you cool it, when you're trying to just keep it hot or when you reheat it. So those are the things that uh, if uh, you, you are um, keeping food and out of those ranges and you're in the danger zone, um, these are the ways that it can happen. So you gotta be careful when you're doing all those things. So now let's talk about ways that various organisms may contaminate food. Um, the most common ways that food is contaminated during the, is during, during the preparation process are um, storing or displaying ready-to-eat foods at room temperature for longer than two hours, um, undercooking food, insufficient reheating of food, inadequate hot holding of food, cooling or defrosting at room temperature for more than two hours. I feel like I just said that, didn't I? And then poor standards of personal hygiene and infected food handlers, okay? You gotta remember that we humans are great vehicles for contamination. In fact, we're a walking food safety hazard. We're really good at spreading bacteria from our bodies around, and because we're always touching and prodding and picking at stuff, we're also masters of cross-contamination too. 
So here's just a few ways we do it uh, by dipping our fingers into taste something, especially when we haven't washed our hands after licking our fingers to separate food bags or wrap. Uh, if we're drying our hands on our clothes or on cleaning cloths, think about it. If you're coughing and sneezing, sputtering and spitting in the food prep area, and if you're munching or smoking in the food area, so don't be munching around. So cross-contamination, uh, think of it as speed dating for germs. Cross-contamination happens when harmful bacteria from one food or a kitchen surface, equipment, or hands is transferred to another food. It's especially dangerous if spread onto ready-to-eat food that won't undergo any further treatment, such as cooking, that would usually kill the bacteria and make the food safe. So that's all about cross-contamination and common ways that it's done during the preparation process. So now let's talk a little bit about why is food buying and handling. Um, food selection, first of all, um, of course it depends on the money you have, your nutritional needs, and the effect of advertisements. Um, each of these factors uh, can influence our selection and food choice. So the money you have, of course, the more money you have, the more food you can buy and the greater your choice is. People with a lot of money can afford a variety of meals and can eat away from home. People with small incomes have a limited choice and it becomes hard uh, to buy enough food to meet family needs. If you're on a limited food budget, you can save money by buying foods that are in season and buying cheaper cuts of meat as well as comparing prices in different shops. Some of the factors that determine the amount of money we spend on food, um, basically a food budget really is one of our largest expenses. Careful planning and shopping can result in substantial savings. Normally, if you're rich, you tend to spend more on food, and if you're poor, you spend less. Um, personal uh, preferences, your skills, your values, your lifestyle will all determine your food selection and hence the money you spend on buying food. Uh, the skill of bargaining, for example, would help you buy goods at the cheapest possible cost. Buying foods in season and in bulk can cut down on your cost. Buying fruit, food from farm gates instead of from retailers also helps you cut cost. When you buy food, uh, buy them from places where prices are lower and where food sold is of good quality. Buy food from places that are clean um, and where food is well stored. So tips for chopping uh, when buying food, choose the form that you can easily handle and which you can afford. Make a shopping list uh, so you buy the things you need without wasting time. Choose the type and location of market appropriate to your needs. Compare prices and quality uh, before you buy. Buy foods in bulk if you have storage facilities. Um, it's cheaper. Don't shop when you're hungry. It makes you buy more than necessary. Lord knows that's the truth. Don't take children when you go grocery shopping. They make you buy unnecessary things. That is so true. Avoid impulse buying, that is, and that's buying things you didn't plan for. And when you buy canned or packaged foods, look out for um, the expiration date or the use by date. Um, that's the last day a product is considered fresh. That's the use by date. A food may still be safe to eat after this date, but the taste and nutrient quality may not be good. So the don'ts. Don't buy processed foods when the following signs are seen. Cans bulging or dented because they may cause food poisoning. Rusty um, can may contain full spoiled food and you know botulism. 
Frozen food packages that are soft or soggy may have thawed for a long time or may be spoiling. Refrozen foods, this can be detected as stained packages or crystallized products. Opened or damaged packages, moldy or colored dry foods, meat or fish that has a dull or slimy surface. Some unscrupulous sellers um, buy products that have expired from the large shops and sell them in open markets at prices that are cheaper. Check the expiration dates and shapes of such items before you buy them. Nutritional needs. Um, your choices will also depend on your need for food, of course, and your nutritional needs, and everybody has a biological need for food. We know that. Essential for life. Um, without food, somebody gets weak and ill. I can think of somebody right now. God bless him. People vary in the amount of food they need for reasons like health, age, and activity. Your food choice uh, depends on each of these factors. Your nutrition knowledge helps you choose food that provides the necessary nutrients to meet your needs. Another influence on food choice is advertisement. Advertisements have a way of persuading you to make choices. Food manufacturers and shops advertise their products through television, radio, magazines, newspapers, posters, and leaflets. Um, Good adverts um, are decent, honest, and truthful. They don't mislead the public about the product. They show a sense of responsibility to people. Um, they conform to fair competition behavior um, between different manufacturers and businesses. All right. So food handling, let's talk a little bit about food storage. Um, food commodities that are purchased from the market have to be stored well if they have to keep their quality. So as soon as you get home from the market, you need to group your items into the following categories, dry storage, frozen storage, and fresh items. Food is stored mostly because we want to keep it safe and prolong its shelf life. There are three types of food storage, um, dry storage, refrigerator, and freezer. So dry storage are foods that have to be kept dry um, they're usually stored in cabinets, things like cereals, canned goods. Y'all get the drift. I don't think I need to go through that. Food should not be stored above a refrigerator or a cooker or near any heat outlet. Uh, the temperatures of these areas are warm and favorable, favorable for the growth of micro, microorganisms. Of course, you have to keep those areas clean. If you spill something, you need to wipe it up to um, avoid attracting insects. Um, canned and packaged food should be placed in a cool, dry cupboard, and when open, they have to be refrigerated. So refrigerated storage, um, the proper temperatures for your refrigerator needs to be at or below 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 degrees Celsius. Um, the freezer temp should be 0 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 18 Celsius. You need to be checking those temperatures periodically. Temperatures in the refrigerator vary depending on the part of the refrigerator. The shelves on the door are not as cold as the inside. And this area is good for storing eggs. The part of the refrigerator is also not very cold, so vegetables can be stored there. Food stored in the refrigerator have to be covered well so that it won't dry out or absorb odors from other foods. Freezer storage, keep your freezer, I said, at zero degrees or below to maintain the quality of the frozen food. Most foods will maintain good quality longer in the freezer if it's negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures between zero and 32 degrees, food deteriorates more rapidly store frozen food in their original packages in the freezer. Foods to be frozen should be wrapped in moisture and vapor-proof wrapping and arranged properly in the freezer. After shopping for food, stored, store frozen foods immediately in the freezer 
so that they'll not thaw completely. And after this, you can store other foods that need refrigeration like eggs, wash fresh vegetables before storing in the vegetable compartment of the fridge, store yams, potatoes, and onions in a cool, dry place. If fruits are not fully ripe, they should be kept at room temperature until they're ripe. They can uh, then be put in the refrigerator when they're ripe and don't store bananas in the fridge because they darken and don't look pretty. Um, food selection, purchase, and storage require the use of many resources. Um, the important ones are, are times, energy, money, storage facilities, knowledge, and market. A good market list is required when shopping to avoid waste. I've already said that. And if you choose wisely, you can save a lot of money while providing adequate meals for yourself and your family. And um, food stored properly are safe and last longer. Okay, so that's food handling and storage. So here's 10 tips um, to be food safe. Of course, uh, we can read them here on the screen. I think um, pretty much I've gone over most of this. Um, this is pretty much common sense. And again, I've gone over this. So um, these are just the tips. So these are um, some of the programs designed to combat malnutrition. I'm not going to read them to you. I'll just go over them real fast. Um, of course, the SNAP program, formerly known as the food stamp program, although I did put the food stamp program on there because it does provide um, benefits for low-income households. Uh, special uh, supplemental nutrition for women, infants and children, or WIC. And there's a Food for Florida, and it's a State of Florida Disasters Food Assistance Program, and it's only active when there is a uh, presidentially uh, declared disaster area in the State of Florida. I did not know that. I found that interesting. And also we have the National School Lunch Program and the School Breakfast Program for our kids so that they can get a good nutritious balanced meal. So basically food habits have developed from many different cultures, beliefs, socioeconomics, environments, and availability in societies uh, from childhood through adulthood. Habits are being formed from experiences with food. As I said a little earlier, um, I did put a different PowerPoint up um, that was specifically on cultural food habits. So I'm really not going to get into it, but this is the gist of it. Please look at the other PowerPoint. Um, the social, psychological, and economic influence on food habits. I feel like we've talked a lot about that already, but um, I'm not going to read this PowerPoint to you. It pretty much is self-explanatory. And um, again, I think we've covered a lot of this already. Food misinformation and food fads, basically, uh, food fads and fad diets are like unusual diets and eating patterns. Sometimes they promote weight loss, blah, blah, blah. We've all heard of food fads um, and the things that, um, you know, they work for a while and then they don't. Um, so you guys can read this uh, little PowerPoint slide and um, uh, there's a video that I posted here for you that um, really was a pretty good video about misinformation and where all of it comes from and how it affects us all. So please take a look at that. So our current eating patterns here in the U.S., we all know that we don't get enough um, veggies, fruits, dairy, and uh, oils that we need that are healthy, and we know that uh, half of the population is meeting or exceeding total grain and total protein food recommendations, but are not meeting the recommendations for the subgroups within each of these food groups. We know that most of us eat more sugar, saturated fat, and sodium, 
And basically that's why two thirds of all adults in the US and nearly one third of all children in the US um, and youth in the United States are overweight or obese. So we're eating fast food, um, we're eating too many calories, we're not eating a healthy diet. Uh, so, you know, we really don't have a really good healthy um, eating pattern here, on, here in the United States.